morning. Um, so I'm going to just uh, touch on uh, these four uh, topics uh, to give you a feel for where we are in, in terms of uh, the, the core system and the infrastructure behind the services so that you can get a sense for how things are going uh, with regard to that operation. Um, infrastructure, uh, as, as you all know and, and would guess that you know, hardware and network is uh, really the primary parts of, of what make up uh, an infrastructure. Um, we continue, we're pretty much a Dell shop. Uh, we, we get a lot of use out of the equipment that we buy. Um, we have kind of a hand-me-down methodology of buying new servers for the, uh, the heavy-duty uh, parts of the system and then Dell hand me, handing down things to, to lesser and lesser uh, critical components. Um, so we, get, we probably get six to eight years out of a server, which is, uh, I think, pretty good. Um, this past year, we've uh, put in a couple of uh, new, new servers and storage devices. Um, we made a big change in our network, uh, the way that the network is uh, operated. Uh, we switched to a managed DNS service uh, offered by DYN. Uh, formerly, we had used the uh, service provided by our IP provider, and uh, that turned out to have some performance problems. Um, and so we made a switch to, to, to DYN, which is going to, uh, gives us uh, better DNS response times and also allows us to do a lot more flexible uh, distribution and traffic routing uh, of services. So we're really positioned very well to um, provide a, a more reliable, a more well-balanced kind of services uh, from, from the infrastructure perspective uh, with this new, this new change. So that went into effect probably uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and then uh, resiliency is kind of the thing we really work on every day, and that is to keep things, um, to stay ahead of the curve with regard to problems and to making sure that we have in place a reliable, a resilient, uh, a redundant uh, infrastructure. Um, we're an Oracle shop, kind of. Part, part of our uh, back ends are all built on Oracle, um, but uh, Oracle is very expensive. It's the enterprise capabilities uh, available through Oracle are tremendous, but you really pay for it, and I'm sure some of you in the room know that. And so what we've done is we've, we've been quite creative in building our own wrapper solutions on top of Oracle to implement some of the things we feel we need to have uh, redundancy and reliability. And so we, uh, this past year we, we put into place a new uh, sort of rollover uh, capability so services can continue through database outages. And the last thing that uh, I'll talk about on this slide is production. Um, there's a couple of different things going on within Crossref. There's core services, and then there's the labs activity, and a little bit of this, uh, there's a, things develop and nurture and take, uh, take shape in, in sort of the labs environment, and then uh, the, the plan is to migrate those things as they mature into, into a more uh, production quality environment. And we've started to do that more and more in the past year. Um, this addresses the physical hosting issues of some of the lab's uh, projects. Uh, but more importantly, it, it brings to bear more staff. It gets more staff involved in these projects. Um, while they're developing, there, there's maybe one or two people who are, are uh, focused on it and understand it, but then as it rolls into production, more people from the U.S. office, intermingle with the UK office people and we get a more uh, better coverage and a better breadth of, of folks working on the problem. So that's all good from a production point of view for the services that we operate. Uh, this slide is just a picture of what the DNS change meant. Um, before we made the DNS change, that was the kind of latency we were seeing from around the globe from our former provider, which was really lousy. And uh, now the DNS latency is negligible from everywhere. So uh, DOIN is, uh, is a very, very powerful, very good service. I highly recommend it. It's, it's not the cheapest one on the block, but they've got some very nice uh, uh, 
capabilities and the interfaces are, are really, really quite nice. Um, this chart shows a, about a month worth of our network bandwidth. And um, this is a pretty much steady state, 10 meg per second, all day, every day, day in, day out. Um, is, is pretty much the kind of traffic we see. Um, our costs are controlled pretty much by uh, renegotiating with our vendors. You know, the Verizon is our, our IP provider, and we renegotiated last year. Quite a remarkable drop in the cost, uh, but yet an increase in the capability and our services. So uh, from a technology perspective, things do get cheaper, and they continue to get cheaper and more powerful. So that's a, that's a big part of why the data center costs and so forth are, are, are so uh, under control. Um, so core system changes, performance uh, is always a big issue. Um, deposit performance is generally not an issue and I have a slide coming up which will point out uh, how that looks to most people. Uh, most of the members of course, you know, deposits are a big part of, uh, of, our, of our revenue and of the mission and uh, tending to and making sure that deposits are uh, dealt with efficiently is, is really one of our key focuses. Uh, query performance is uh, very important as well. And we've done some changes to the way the software uh, is, set up, is set up. And we've achieved some really nice uh, improvements in that, in that area. Um, we continually to add new features to the, to the core system. Uh, callback notifications was one thing that went online uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is intended to replace email as the way in which you get notified that your logs, that your deposits are complete. So now it's a much more sophisticated, a much more contemporary way of feeding that information back to the membership. So there's a little bit of effort required on the, on the member side to implement that, uh, that service, but we think it's the, really the, the best way to, to move forward. Uh, conflicts are another area that we are always challenged, uh, challenged by, both members and, uh, and staff. Um, as you know, uh, conflicts are when there's two DOIs that essentially point to the same thing. That causes a lot of headache and a lot of heartache and problems. And um, the, the model in the past was pretty much we will identify the problem and we expect members to respond and correct the problem. Um, over the years, that hasn't really worked that well. Uh, some publishers are very responsive, take care of the problems all the time. Um, but it looks like uh, we're going to have to become a little bit more proactive in correcting problems on, that we find and preventing problems. Whereas in the past, we let the problems exist and expected uh, the members to, to fix it. Uh, I think now we're going to become more proactive in preventing and fixing ourselves. And I think we have some good schemes uh, to resolve what are the, the, the downfalls and the negative consequences of, of conflicts. Um, and so that, that'll be happening over the next uh, month or two. So from a deposit perspective, this is uh, October uh, last month. And you can see the quantity of deposit activity that's actually taking place. Um, Interesting month in that uh, Taylor and Francis uh, submitted 44,000 uh, deposits, and these were really updates. So they're they're tweaking existing DOIs, and you see the wait time that's associated with them is uh, 2,900 minutes. That's a lot. Um, but what happened here was uh, Taylor and Francis sent in 44,000 like all at once. And so they really filled up the queue and had a lot of jobs in there, which basically took a long time to shuffle through. Um, when that kind of thing happens, we have to uh, take a little bit of horsepower away from Taylor and Francis so that everybody else doesn't get starved. You can see that Elsevier, Elsevier uh, updates their DOIs quite regularly, and they are the largest uh, contributor of DOIs, so there's a lot of activity. You can see there's 229,000 deposits that they made, only 516 minutes. Or five, it was the average wait, wait time. Um, they meter. The way that they send the files in, you know, they're much more uh, measured, much more in control of the process. So this is pretty much what goes on every month for, with regard to Elsevier. 
uh, updating. They have another account that they can use to send in their new stuff, which goes through much quicker. But you can see the, the, longer, uh, the, the longer tail of some of the bigger contributors. But the thing to really note is during that month, there were 94,000 deposits from 214 deposits. That took less than an hour, which is really pretty good given the onslaught of uh, information coming in from Taylor Francis and elsewhere for that month. But 247,000 took less than 10 minutes. So this is an, uh, October is a good example of a bad month, uh, really. Most months don't look like this. The averages are much, much lower. But the message I'm trying to get across is deposit activity, I think, is, is going along exceedingly well. We hear no complaints, and um, just wanted to put up the kind of statistics so you, you can see how it's, how, it's, how it's operating. From a query perspective, this is where uh, members are, members' machinery are sending in a, an, a query looking for the DOI for a, given, um, for a given article. The top chart is from early in the year when we were having some issues. Uh, looks like a polygraph from a very agitated person. But the two lines, which are a little bit hard to distinguish, are the, uh, the red line and the blue line. The red line is the quantity of queries happening, and that's measured against the left-hand vertical axis. And the blue line is the response time, internal response time, measured against the right-hand axis. And I did pick a particularly bad day to, to show this. But you can see the response times are not, not that great uh, all the time. And the volumes of querying are usually around 18,000. And that's over a 10-minute window. So every 10 minutes, 18,000 uh, queries. The bottom chart shows. Uh, what is now the norm, this is like every day looks like this. And the red line shows 25,000, 30,000, peaks up approaching 40,000 uh, queries per 10 minutes. And the blue line is the response time, and uh, that's a really good looking line. Uh, we're, we're, we're quite happy with, with this performance. So um, we're, doing, we're doing well and staying on top of, of uh, the operation of the system. Feature changes. Uh, books. A lot of talk yesterday at the workshops about books. We're putting in place a new service to deal with some of the peculiar uh, circumstances that apparently exist in book hosting. And um, that is going to get rolled out the end of this month. And we're looking for a couple of uh, members to participate in the pilot. It's, it's something called co-access. I won't go into the details here. But uh, we are working on books because um, We've heard from the membership that this, this is a problem. As Ed said, uh, there's, a, there's a group working on standards, redefining the deposit schema, redefining how to organize standards uh, metadata so it better represents the real world of standards. And then uh, the metadata query changes. Um, we, we're, we're changing the way we deal with conflicts, as I said before. Instead of relying on the membership to actually fix the problems, we're going to make some decisions to return data more often than we were in the past um, based on some new logic that we're putting in place. Uh, the schema has, has changed uh, over the course la of the last year. Uh, fund ref changes, of course, were, were 2013. Uh, text and data mi mining changes regarding licensing and, and those kinds of things have, been, uh, have, have appeared in the schema this past year. And finally, um, Things that are, that, are, that are in the works are, are going to be working on soon. ORCIDs, um, we've always accepted, we've, for a long time, we've accepted in the deposit an ORCID. So if you have uh, an author uh, or a paper and you know the ORCID, you've been able to deposit that to Crossref for quite a while now. Uh, this is an integration with ORCID itself so that the papers that we get that have ORCIDs, we can inform ORCID of that and the author can then um, claim that paper and put it into their profile. Uh, we believe we've got a common understanding now with the ORCID, uh, with, with the folks at ORCID on how to make this work. And uh, I think we're, we're, we should be able to move forward on that fairly quickly. The, the, the ball still is in their court to take care of something that we need to have in place first. Uh, article title cleanup. Um, over the years, 12, 14 years now, um, a lot of uh, a lot of problems have occurred, damage to article titles, both because of bugs in the system over the years or in, in errors from publisher deposits. And so our, our article titles, uh, by and large, it's very good metadata. I, I would say, you know, 
90, 90 plus percent of it is fine. But there's a good amount of it where there's special character problems, uh, article title, subtitle splits that are kind of all mangled up. So we're going to start trying to fix some of that stuff um, in, in the metadata. Uh, relations, uh, there was a new relation subschema released uh, just the other week, which allows for the definition of relations between DOIs, cross ref DOIs, and other things. Other things may be other cross ref DOIs, they may be uh, external DOIs, i.e., data site DOIs, or they may be URLs or things identified using some other kind of scheme uh, out there in the wild. But the, the, the bottom line is you'll be able to uh, assign a piece of metadata to a DOI saying this thing is related to this other thing. And one example that is pretty easy to understand is uh, reviews. So if, uh, if you deposit a DOI for a thing that's a book review, and many, many publishers do, you'll be able to insert the DOI of the book that's uh, being reviewed, and that'll be linked in, in the relationship in the metadata. Uh, stored queries. Um, we have uh, 252 million unresolved stored queries, and uh, right now we run about a million a day, uh, but we've recently discovered, thanks to uh, some of our friends at CAMG, that uh, we had a couple of uh, bugs in there that was uh, uh, causing the SQL processing to not work properly, so we, we do have to get through and uh, and, and, and fix that. This is very important for Cited By. Uh, Cited By depends on stored queries to run effectively. And then new content types. Um, members have for a long time used uh, databases and components as sort of the choice of last resort to deposit content for stuff that's not exactly journals, books, or conference proceedings. And so we're really exploring now what it would mean to um, have content types, genres for, for, web, for online web content or other dedicated content types, like a standard. Standard, we have a dedicated content type for standards. Uh, we're thinking we might need a dedicated content type for legal content, um, uh, for training material. So uh, this, this is all kind of brand new discussions that are happening now, but I think we will be expanding the pie chart that, that Ed showed earlier to new content. Um, and that's all I have for my uh, <laughs> bit. Um, you want to take questions later or now? Any okay. Questions any questions at this point? Thank you. Okay.